to the ROI channel, the channel that's assessed with the scientific art, <laughs> the art and science of return on investment. And today we've got another stock analysis. We're heading into a different part of the portfolio, which you may have noticed, uh, which is the, the part of the portfolio with a convexity bias or a fancy way of saying those stocks with a, a limited and defined downside and a potentially massive uh, return or outperformance on the upside. Uh, to keep your eyes peeled. We've got the quarterly review coming up and we've also got a question and answer segment. Thank you to all of those uh, questions that came in from investors, excuse me, and the uh, YouTube audience alike. I'll be addressing those in uh, videos tomorrow. So without further ado, let's get into it. A bit of a clickbaity title, okay, buy a uh, dollar for 99 cents and get a free business. But that's exactly what's going on with this uh, next scenario, nano dimension technology. If you haven't already liked and subscribed to the channel, I would greatly appreciate you doing that. And without further ado, let's get into it. So the Crassus speculation formula, which is slightly different to the investment formula, and it uh, plays a, a certain role in the portfolio, we're still looking for margin of safety, okay? That never changes. We are looking more at a contrarian thesis with the uh, more speculative bets. Those with a convexity bias, which if you uh, read the book Anti-Fragile by Nassim Taleb, you'll understand uh, what that means. Basically, it's uh, think of a, a, a parabola, okay? Or half of a parabola that's going up. You've got a limited downside and uh, potentially exponential upside and high reward with limited and defined risk. Appropriate allocation in the portfolio, so we're not betting the farm on uh, a risky uh, long odd strategy, and an exit strategy with this one. We're not looking to necessarily hold uh, for a long period of time, and that's the difference. I'll get into uh, another video perhaps specifically dedicated to the differences um, and demarcation between investment and speculation, but I believe that both have a case when done intelligently. So it's gonna be a different format. The quick facts of the company I'll quickly roll through, but they're not that important. This is a company that has raised capital, uh, listed to raise capital, and they're gonna use that capital to acquire other businesses and grow. So the revenue is like $5 million from their original business. EBITDA 2.2, okay, it's tiny, it's nothing. There'd be private businesses out there that would do more than that. Here's where it gets interesting. The market cap, 1.42 billion. Market cap is the shares outstanding times the share price. The enterprise value, $108 million, is the market capitalization plus the net debt. Okay, so market cap plus the debt minus the cash. The enterprise value is what um, the, the true value of the business, the ongoing uh, entrepreneur, entrepreneurial activities of the business. So take away the cash and take away uh, anything that's on the balance sheet there except the debt, and that is the, the enterprise value. The current share price, $5.56. Shares are outstanding. We've got 257 million shares on issue. And um, return on capital, you really have none at the moment because they've raised uh, so much with their, their um, equity issuance. They have a negative net debt, okay? So they have more cash on the balance sheet. They've sold um, a heap of their shares, which has diluted the, the shares quite a bit. And we're gonna talk about more, uh, more about that in a moment. It's summed up nicely by this chart. So if we look at the price action over the last five years, all the way up here uh, in the $80, $90 region, and look, it just sort of falls off a cliff. The reason being they started to issue so much uh, equity, okay? And around about here, Kathy Wood came along and bought up a heap of that, the ARK Investment Funds, and that pushed the price um, almost parabolic uh, in that short period of time. And so what we're looking at today is what does the future hold for nano dimensions technology? So the key points, the qualitative factors of the business, essentially the way that I'm looking at this is it's a private equity business that's listed on the public market, okay? So private equity will um, have an idea, they'll go into a given industry that they think is right for a, a roll up or an M&A binge and go uh, raise a heap of capital. They usually use a lot of debt. In this case, Nano Dimensions have decided to issue a lot of equity. So they sell, create a heap more shares, sell them onto the open market if there's the uh, interest and they are going to use that capital to buy out other private businesses related to businesses in their sector, which is 
3D printing uh, and ongoing services. So they'll sell the printers, they'll sell in all the whatever goes along with that, um, repairs and maintenance uh, and the supplies. And they're looking to um, expand into uh, electronics and AI. So they just bought, uh, I know electronics are very broad, uh, industry, but they're looking to get right into that and create synergies between artificial intelligence, electronics, and uh, 3D printing. Uh, try and own the distribution pipeline and create a hell of a lot of uh, cost synergies. So they're going to buy a heap of revenue. If you want to think of the top line, they're going to uh, go through and make the businesses more efficient, increasing their margins, increasing their profit at the end of the day and their free cash flow, and thus increasing the value of their businesses. They acquired Deep Cube recently, an AI company. As I mentioned, huge dilution in the past, which is why where the contrarian thesis comes in. Uh, if you were a shareholder beforehand, you'd be uh, perhaps a little annoyed that uh, all of a sudden you've had a, a share dilution, which is generally the opposite of what we want. We want share buybacks. However, I guess the company uh, is going in the direction where they need a lot of capital, choices between raising a lot of debt, raising a lot of equity. They decided to raise a lot of equity. The short interest was huge. It was about 36% um, just a couple of months ago, and it's come down to 10% uh, now. So that's another a little kicker. If you're looking at short interest, if you believe in the fundamentals of the business and there's a, a large short float, that means other people have borrowed those shares and sold them without owning them onto the, the open market. Now, if you get a situation like we saw with AMC and GameStop and, and um I believe the Reddit crowd tried to do it with the silver market as well, where people uh, notice the short float and they start to buy the shares to pump up the price volume. If you imagine, if you're short that particular company, you are losing a heap of money the higher that the stock price goes. So eventually, uh, you'll have to cover your short or your, bro or your broker will... Um, Either you have to maintain your margin or your broker will close out the position, okay? So you can um, potentially profit from... Uh, indiscriminate use of uh, short selling if you um, can, can identify a quality, or well, not a quality, but a, a, a decent company that has been unfairly shorted. And as that price starts to revert higher, those people will actually push the price up even more because they have to cover their shorts. Okay, this is a, I don't know what to call this segment. I've just called it a logical valuation. It's not a, um, you know, certainly not discounted cash flow because the company doesn't really have cash flow yet. They're going out to buy their cash flows. Uh, so feel free to drop a comment if you've got a better suggestion. But the essentially the way I'm looking at it is this. So they've got um, a market cap of 1.4 billion. So the shares times by the share price, 1.4 billion. That's the you know the value nominal value of the company. But they've got 1.5 billion in cash uh, recently on the balance sheet. They've since spent some of that. But when I was looking at it. I mean, you're literally, if you, if you were to buy the whole company, you're buying the company for less than the cash that they have on the balance sheet. So essentially think about it this way. You're buying $1.5 billion for $1.4 billion, okay? Um, all, all else being equal, that's a good deal, I'm sure you would agree. So here's what we, we want to look at. If you look at it on a per share basis, people find that a bit easier to understand. So if we take the cash and equivalents, 1.5 billion, divide that by the shares outstanding, the 256.49, and that would suggest if you take all the cash the company has and divide it by the number of shares, that's $5.85 cash, only cash per share. Okay, my initial entry price was five dollars and sixty-seven. Okay, so if you look at um, that as a percentage or as a ratio, uh, it's you're buying a dollar for ninety-seven cents. Okay, I know it said ninety-nine cents in the the, the thumbnail, but at ninety-nine cents sounds better. So anyway, you're getting an even better deal. Put it that way. So if you were to buy, go away. If you were to buy the stock at that price, you would be buying a dollar for ninety-seven cents, effectively and get a free business. Now, albeit we don't know how good that business is gonna be run in the future, uh, but I'm actually quite confident. I love the industry, I like where it's going. And the last time I invested in a, um, a, a floated private equity roll up, if, you, if that's even a, a word, a business that was uh, recently listed to raise capital to go and buy other companies was a business in Australia called Unity Wireless, okay? And did very, very well, made over three times my money in uh, a 12 month period. So uh, Vaughn, uh, if you're watching, Vaughn Adams down at Brighton Guy, thanks for that, uh, you made me a lot of money. And um, moving forwards, let's have a look. 
let's take a look at the acquisition side. So the company's got their cash, they're gonna go out and buy private businesses. I've been told that in this uh, particular industry, you're looking at about six times the EBITDA multiple to pay for these companies, okay? So you're gonna look out, you're gonna, they're gonna find an AI business, for example, or an electronics business, and they're gonna look at the numbers and the company's EBITDA that they wish to acquire. They're generally going to want a six times multiple um, for the sale, okay? So let's just assume that that's um, how, they'll, how they'll do it. If they've got 1.5 billion to play with in cash, divided by six, we're looking at $250 million uh, worth of EBITDA per annum uh, from the get-go. Let's, let's say that over the 12-month period, they can buy, um, they can spend all their money on the businesses and acquire as many as they can. Six times EBITDA gives you uh, an immediate $250 uh, million in EBITDA per annum. Market capitalization is suggesting that um, at 1,400, uh, 1,400 million, so 1.4 billion, 5.6 uh, times the expected uh, collective EBITDA. This is where the kicker comes in. So oftentimes uh, you'll see a private equity companies um, merge and acquire the smaller companies on the private market. Then when you go to list it on the public market, you automatically pay more for those businesses than you would on the private markets. And that's to do with the um, the risk associated with public versus private, it's to do with the liquidity factor and, and so on and so forth, getting access to audited financials and all the rules that publicly listed companies have to follow, you're expected to pay a premium for that. So uh, a time-tested way of arbitraging these is to buy p private companies where because you don't have the liquidity, you don't have the, generally speaking, access to audited financials, uh, it's a higher risk game, so on and so forth, then you you take these less sophisticated businesses privately, you merge them, and then you float the new entity on the public market at a higher multiple, okay? Competitors are trading, uh, from what I've seen, at an 8.5 times EBITDA. So we've got an inbuilt arbitrage there. They're acquiring these businesses at six, they're gonna uh, be valued on the public markets at eight, and that's before any synergies uh, in costs occur, okay? So I haven't even, gone through and analyzed the, the case where nano dimensions can make those businesses more efficient, which would almost certainly be the case. I mean, if they can get uh, all these business, businesses together and you've got um, $250 million worth of EBITDA just from what they've bought, they will go through these business, businesses, look at their expense columns and say, what doesn't need to be there, okay? They don't need, if they buy six businesses, they don't need six different websites, okay? They can combine that into the one. They don't need um, six different uh, accounting staff uh, faculties. They can really uh, lean that out and reduce that. So we would expect that in, over time, instead of 250, their margins would really start to increase and their free cash flow will increase uh, on the bottom line again. However, if we're conservative when we say, okay, they've got their um, $250 million worth of EBITDA, if we apply an 8.5 multiple to that, not assuming absolutely no improvements in the business whatsoever, we've got an increase in, in value of enterprise value to EBITDA. Looking, we're looking at 12 billion, 12.75 billion, okay? If we divide that, if we assume no further dilution and no uh, reduction in the shares on issue, we're looking at an implied share price of $49.61. Now, I'm not saying that's going to happen, uh, but it is a possibility. It's an outlier, but it's a strong possibility, I believe. And so the question uh, comes, is that uh, a reward we're, we're happy with? Yes, of course. What's the risk? Well, the risk is that it's unproven. So they haven't acquired... Uh, They've acquired some of these businesses, but they haven't fully executed the business plan. They've taken forever, okay? The, the share price was dropping just a, a few months ago because the management was, I don't know what they were doing. They were just sitting around with all this cash and for love nor money, they couldn't buy a, <laughs> couldn't buy a deal. Uh, that seems to be changing now with the acquisition of Deep Cube. So let's hope that they're, they're getting their act into gear because this has an incredible upside potential. Now, obviously you can go through and you can apply a sensitivity to that. You can say, well, what if it's only a, a seven times multiple? What 
What if it's a nine? What if it's a 10? You guys can play around that uh, using this same kind of principle. But if we are to get that just, I suppose, industry mean reversion in terms of multiple, and that's a nine bagger. So nine times our money um, or 44% as an IRR or annualized rate of return. So that's definitely something that we're interested is in. And so the verdict for me is back to jockey, okay? The management seem, they've had changes in the management. The new management seems to be doing well. They're actually doing what they were supposed to do, going out and buying these uh, private businesses and looking to add value and uh, increase the, the multiple valuations of the share price of the parent company and so it'll be interesting to see uh, i'm backing the jockey we have a margin of safety so it fits that criteria contrarian thesis the market was getting very bored with this business i believe it was the old management sitting around and not really doing what they were supposed to do convexity bias certainly i mean we've got a limited downside we can lose in this case 1.2 percent of our capital and potentially have a nine-fold return so that's definitely there Outsized returns, yes, 44% IRR will smash the market in any year that I can think of. We have a limited and defined risk, yes we do. We have an appropriate allocation, yes we do. Only 1.2% of the assets under management. We don't need to go and do anything crazy. And the exit strategy is there. So uh, if we were to make uh, double our money on this particular position, I would trim half of the um, of the position okay i would let the rest ride okay and so we've got our our exit strategy planned i would then say if we do get all the way to you know eight or nine times our money i'll take the rest of it off the table and look to um and look to find other opportunities at that given time thanks for watching i hope you're excited about this opportunity as i am leave your comments below if you have any questions uh, thank you for those who are copying the portfolio if you wish to either just add us to a watch list or you want to copy by all means click on the portfolio link uh, that i'll leave in the description and you can either add to the watch list or if you're ready to go and you've got a couple of uh, dollars to put behind by all means completely up to you and and if you haven't already liked and subscribed to the channel, I would greatly appreciate that. It does the algorithm the world of good. I'm going to leave it there. Look after yourself and always do your due diligence, okay? Uh, I'm not your financial advisor, so make sure you're responsible with your decision making. And uh, I wish you all the best. I'll be back uh, for the monthly report and questions tomorrow and the day after.